let the Spirit of God speak to you this morning. Amen. Let him speak to you this morning. We have a lot that's going on. There's things that's happening in our church and in our community and in our own personal lives. But the greatest thing that I am seeing that's unfolding before us again is deception. It is deception. Many are deceiving themselves. Deceiving themselves. Not, we want to blame the devil. We want to give him credit all too much. But my dear friend, there are many in this room right here. You're deceiving your own self. I'm in the book of Mark, chapter number 2. The book of Mark this morning, chapter number 2. And uh, you listen as the Lord is speaking. And my dear friend, I, I hope and I pray that uh, we're on the same page this morning. If not, I love you still the same. Amen. I promise you I do. Mark chapter number 2, Mark chapter number 2, I hope that's what I said. Mark chapter number 2, and uh, we'll begin reading here verse number 14, and then we're going to turn over to 1 Peter chapter number 2. Mark chapter number 2, verse number 14, the Word of God says, He, and as he, talking about Jesus, passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of customs, and said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. My dear friend, it'll do a good day for you to make up your mind and say you're going to follow Jesus. See, too many people are sitting down right now, just like Levi, sitting down on God, sitting down on the Lord Jesus Christ. But as I said, God's got a purpose for your life. He has a plan for your life. But you got to get up and follow after Jesus. Not after your flesh, not after yourself, not after you, but following after Jesus. Now see, many of you, you will love to follow after the things that please the flesh. You'll go after a sport, you'll go after an activity, you'll go after something that's very what? Commodious unto you. It's not conflicting to your soul, it's not sacrificing this flesh, it's not crucifying the old old man is pleasing to you. That's not what Jesus said. He said, follow me. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, follow me. And what did he do? He arose and he followed him. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at the meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples. And there were many and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw that he ate with the publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, how is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners. Jesus heard it and said unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I am come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. 1 Peter chapter 2. I'll give you a second there to find that. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse number 24, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, the Word of God says again about Jesus, who his own self bare our sins and his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sin, should live unto what church? Righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Our Father... Again, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for the precious time to be in the house of God. I thank you for those that know you. Lord, I thank you for those, Lord, that are striving, Lord, to walk in the straight and narrow way. Lord, they're not living a life of hypocrisy. Lord, they're genuine before you. Lord, I thank you for those individuals, O oh God of heaven, that, Lord, are letting their light so shine before me. And, Lord, I am praying for God, the Holy Ghost, Lord, to bring forth such great conviction as we have never experienced. Lord, your bride is sleeping on you, and it's time that we wake up. Lord, we are in need of a touch from God. 
We're in need of a touch from you, Almighty God. I'm asking of you now. Lord, we know that we may look strange in the eyes of those that are in darkness. But oh, help us to be strange, oh God, in this land and let people know that we're just passing through. Let them know, oh God of heaven, that you're real and you're good, you're gracious, you're mighty, you're holy, you are God. I thank you for the privilege, Lord, to stand here one more time to open up the Holy Word of God to preach the book. Lord, I am asking that you'd help us, Lord, that we'd not be a stumbling stone, but Lord, may we be a stepping block. Father, for that individual now, I do pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Church, we see here in the text that the scribes in Mark chapter 2, rather, Mark chapter 2, we see the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, they were there in the room where Jesus was in the room. And I thank God I can say Jesus is in the room. Amen. I want to say this here. The scribes, they went over to the disciples and they said, hey, why is Jesus sitting there with those sinners and talking to those publicans and so forth? My dear friend, isn't that the same way? People People don't want to go straight to the source. They want to talk behind someone's back. Amen. Why not you go to the source, dear friend? If you got a problem with somebody, address that individual. But we see the Pharisees and who they are. The Pharisees were individuals who had a very hard heart. They were hard-hearted individuals. They were people that had a form of godliness but denied the power thereof. Matter of fact, their heart hearts were so hard, Jesus spoke a parable over in Luke chapter 15. And you read that if you want to take notes and go back home now. In Luke chapter 15, you'll find out Jesus spoke three parables against the Pharisees. It was one about the lost sheep. It was the other one with the lost coin. And the other one was the prodigal son. And what Jesus was telling the Pharisees is that their heart was so hard, they could not even rejoice when one that was lost is now found. Amen. Oh, isn't that the same way today? You tell about somebody getting saved, and boy, you'll see somebody get mad. Oh, I, I know. Amen. You tell about somebody getting born again, delivered from the wages of their sins, no longer going to go to hell, no longer going to spend eternity in hell, but they've been redeemed through the blood of the Lamb, and boy, they'll get mad. They'll act like who? The older son. Go run out in the field and pout and whine and complain. They'll go out there and say, well, nobody treated me that way. Nobody did that for me. I can't believe my name wasn't called out. I can't believe I was recognized. I'm just telling you, church, this is the Pharisees. Now, if that lays in your lap right there, then that's all on you. But that's the Pharisees' heart. I mean, they were so hard-hearted. They did not like it when people repented of their sins and trusted in God. Why? Because it was all about them and their religion. It was all about them. The Pharisees there could not even rejoice in salvation and seeing somebody's life being changed there. In essence, here we're seeing that the Pharisees were blind individuals. They were blind to their own condition. They were blind to the condition of their heart. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15 and in verse number 14 about the Pharisees that they were blind men leading those that were blind. And he said, the blind lead the blind, let them lead them. That's what he said now. We see that they did not know and were not aware of their need and their condition. And I'm asking you that this morning. Are you aware of your need of this hour? Are you aware of your need? What you have in your life is a necessity. Are you aware of what you need that only God can provide? Jesus said this in the text of Mark chapter 2. And notice he said, they that are whole have no need of the physician. In essence, he said, those that look at themselves and say, I'm complete, I'm okay, I don't need to go to the doctor. I don't need to go to the physician here. But Jesus is telling them, but they that are sick need the physician. And by the grace of God, I want to preach on this thought. I need the doctor. Amen. I 
need the doctor. May I say, there are many souls that are bleeding out today. There are many lives that you're not living the life that God has called you to live. You're living below the standard, but you think you're pure in your own eyes. You think you're good in your own eyes, but according to the Holy Word of God, my dear friend, you're just like the Pharisee deceiving yourself. Oh, friend, God's got a life for us to live. And boy, it's a wonderful life. Now, I ain't trying to suck the life out of you, and that did, I'm sorry for you. But I'm just telling you, dear friend, this life that we have inside of us is living and breathing there. The Holy Ghost of God lives inside the believer. Why does it look like you're dead? I don't know. Maybe it's because you're bleeding out and you need the doctor, amen? Oh, we should be lively individuals, praise the God, full of life there. Can I say there are many souls that are bleeding out. Bleeding out, why? Because just like the pride that filled the heart of the Pharisees are filling the hearts of many. The need for a doctor it seems to be diminishing in our days, doesn't it? Oh, I'm telling you, why is that? We got all, we've got all these self-help books out there. Boy, you can purchase one online. You can Google something and look up WebMD. And you don't need to go to the doctor. Does it not seem that way? It seems that people are no longer wanting to go visit the doctor and see to that individual there. They can give a self-diagnosis and everything will be all fine right there. People are resorting in this day we're living in to unproven methods there to treat themselves and to give them a health care. And I'll say this, the same thing can be said in the spiritual realm as well. That people are going to things that is not right and seeking for spiritual healing. I want you to know here this morning, church, whether if you believe it or not, you need the healing that only Christ can give. Amen. You need that spiritual healing that only he can give. Matter of fact, maybe some of you need a physical healing and he's the only one that can give that as well. Amen. Listen to me, listen to me well. Hey, everybody, you need a doctor, amen. You need a doctor even when you're healthy, you need a doctor, amen. Hey, a doctor will help you out in curing an illness, but also a doctor will help you out in preventing illnesses to come into your life, amen. I'm grateful and thankful that there's proven, there's tried tests that a doctor, a good doctor, will do and will perform in your life to make sure that everything's good and working good and your body. And if not, they'll nine times out of ten to tell you what you need to do. You need to push away from the table. You're eating too much. Uh -huh. And we don't like hearing that from the doctor, but sometimes it is the truth. Amen. Why? Because he's trying to help you out. Trying to make you healthy there. Preventing that sickness to come your way. Why does the preacher say come back Sunday night and Wednesday night? To prevent that sickness from coming your way. Amen. Amen. Now listen to me here. We see in the text that Jesus Christ is using an earthly example of doctors to convey that spiritual need of the spiritual healing that only he can give. Now they had physicians in biblical days. We know that. Over in Colossians chapter 4, you'll find out, the matter of fact, the apostle Luke, he was called a physician. There's nothing wrong with going to see an earthly doctor. But an earthly doctor cannot do for you what the heavenly doctor can do. The earthly doctor cannot do for you what Jesus Christ can do for you. And I'm trying to open up your eyes and let you realize, dear friend, that life is not okay living in your way and going your route there. But if you go Christ's route, praise the Lord, he can minister healing to your soul that you need. Every single one of us here today Today, you're battling something, you're struggling with something, and nine times out of ten, the thing that you're struggling with, it is a sin. Amen. Listen, friend. Hey, uh, the, the sickness that's going on and everyone needs a physician because why? Everyone is born with the sickness that's called sin. Say, preacher, again, why are you preaching so much on sin? Because it's availing, it's prevailing in the day that we are living in. It's even creeping into the house of God. Amen. You can say amen Oh me on that there. But here we see the sickness of sin and everyone's affected by it because why? Every single one of us have sinned. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. We've all, like sheep, have gone astray, the Bible tells us. We've all come short of the glory of God. On your very best day, you're still worthy of hell. We're all sinners. 
None of us are righteous, my dear friend. We've got that problem in our life, and it's called sin, and it brings sickness into your life. Say, preacher, I'm saved by the grace of God. No, you still let sin rule and reign in your life. He's called us to live a life of what? Righteousness. Did we not read that in the Holy Word of God? You let sin rule and reign in your life, you're going to have sickness infesting in your soul, in your spirit, in the spiritual life that God has given to us. Listen to me, friend. Hey, can I just say this? Sin, it is anything that offends Jehovah. Sin is anything that offends Jehovah. And you need to take an account of this. I want to say this. You are either in one of these categories. I mean, this might apply to you. Maybe it doesn't. But you may be in one of these categories here where you fall into the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, or the pride of life. Now, the lust of the eyes, they say, it typically goes toward the younger age, right? Miss Patricia was talking about the kids up here and how they wanted the Christmas toys. That's what appeals the eye, what they can have, what they can purchase, what they can get there. That's the lust of the eyes. But then the middle-aged people are in the lust of the flesh of what they can do to make the flesh more comfortable. Amen. Oh, preacher, you're talking about my comfort right now. Boy, we're spoiled rotten. You ought to say amen right there. I know I'm right. You ain't got to say amen. I know I'm right. I mean, look, look what we have, church. Patty Pews got a heater that works very, very good. Amen. amen. When we leave, you got very good cars to go out and drive in. Amen. When you go home, you don't have to worry about nobody coming after you, taking your life, going to kill you. You didn't have to wake up this morning. Do you know that there's missionaries out there in the field right now? That Brother Barney, they're facing death in the eyes. They're looking at death. Why? Not because they're opposing uh, communism. It's because they're preaching Christ. I'm telling you, we're spoiled rotten. We think we know about this thing of living for God. We're, we got a rude awakening, church. Oh, this lust of the flesh make me comfortable. Make me appealing right there. Make me feel like I'm at a show, preacher. Amen. Amen. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And now they typically say those in the golden years are in the pride of life. And I think there are even some in the middle that's in the pride of life, but that's all right. Because why? You're not going to tell me anything that's going to change me. I like the way I live. I like the way I'm living right now. I like what I'm doing. You're not going to change me. I'm telling you, dear friend, that's sin. That sin in the eyes of God when you're full of pride. I want to say this as well. There's a lie that the devil is spreading out there and is telling saved folk are holding. They're, they're believing this lie the devil is saying. He's saying you don't have to name sin. People know that they're wrong. People know that they're sinners. They just need encouragement. Preacher, well, I'm trying to encourage you. Whatever sin that you've committed and offended the Christ holy God, he'll forgive you of it if you repent. Amen. 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 And I'm just going to tell you, when God forgives you, dear friend, that burden is lifted. Hallelujah. That weight is gone, praise God. And you need the great physician to minister healing to your soul. Amen. Listen to me now. Sin is still sin and God still calls it sin and we're going to side with him over you any day. Hey, over 2,000 years ago, if he called it sin, you should be calling it sin. Lying is still sin. Amen. Say, preacher, I don't lie. I just tell a white lie. Well, white lie, black lie, green lie, red lie, whatever you want to label it, a lie is a lie, friend. Amen. amen, amen. Oh, I'm just telling you, you shouldn't be lying. God forbid you lie to your boss. Hmm. Say, preacher, ever happened to you? Well, they didn't come out and tell me, but the truth always comes out. Amen. amen. God forbid the Bible says stealing is still sin. God forbid that you go to your job and you rob your job. Say, so I'll rob my job, preacher. God forbid you go in there and they give you a 10-minute lunch break or 20-minute lunch break and you take five more minutes. Say, so, oh, preacher, you're meddling. No, my dear friend, you don't realize how serious this thing is robbing. See, the Bible even says, would a man rob God? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, he will. Oh, tithes and offering. Oh, I ain't going to give nothing in that plate. I ain't going to give nothing to that. My dear friend, you better wake up and wake up now and come to the reality of what, what God's word says. Hey, the tenth is his anyway. So, oh, preacher, that's the Old Testament. We'll talk about that later if you want to. Nonetheless, my dear friend, the tenth, that's still his. The offering is on top of that. Oh, preacher, you're meddling in my money. Well, there goes the problem. You're saying it's your money. 
Who gave you the health that you have? Who gave you the mind that you have? Who given you the ability to do what you do? You think you got that all on your own? No, my dear friend. A God in heaven created you and I and has given it to us, praise God. Boasting yourself all you want to. Beat your own drum all you want to. And said, I did this. Great will be your fall as well. Hey, sin is sin, friend. God still calls it sin. Lying is sinning. Stealing is sinning. Fornication is sin. Oh, friend, hey, don't clam up on me now. And preacher, you're meddling. No, I'm telling you, don't you realize what's happening in our world? Don't you realize what's being taught to our children and what the adults themselves is agreeing to? It's okay for you to have sex outside of marriage. Your friends, you love one another. And you know, love always triumphs. Not according to the word of God, friend. A sin is sin. And you fornicate. You go right ahead. You, matter of fact, I'll say this right here. I was telling my oldest son right here, and I'll tell you the same thing. Paul talks about over there to the Corinth church about fornication. And he said, that's a sin that has scarred the body. Oh, it's a sin that has scarred the body. And you'll live with What are you saying? See, there's some people in this room, you've never tasted how sweet apples are because you don't like them. The preacher, that's far to hard to believe. Well, maybe it is far hard to believe. But anyway, some of you don't like it. You don't know what it tastes like. But if you've ever tasted an apple, you'll never forget it. See, when you cross over that line into sexual sin, you've tasted that sin and you'll never forget it. It's sin. You need to stay away from it. I, I'm telling you this right here. It's my heart's prayer. It should be your heart's prayer for our kids and our adults that are single, that don't have no bride, that don't have, hey, the marriage bed is undefiled. Praise God, the Bible tells us that. But a whoremonger shall be judged in the sight of God. Did he not say that? He said that. Our prayer should be what? Our children come down the aisle. They kept themselves clean and pure before the God of glory. Hallelujah. And unite together in holy matrimony. Amen. Fornication is wrong. I didn't say it was wrong. God said it was wrong. It's sin. I say, preacher, it happens. You ought to teach them how to be safe in doing that. Where, where's the logic in that, friend? There is no such thing as safe sex. See, it's something that man puts a band-aid on the sickness of sin. Oh, oh yes. Man puts a band-aid on something that's gushing out, it's bloody, it's gruesome. This thing of sin, you can't put a band-aid on it. You need healing from it. Amen. Oh, I'm trying, to tell, I'm trying to help you out, I promise you. There's that thing of lust, this thing of pride, this thing of drinking that is prevailing in the day and age that we live in. Say, preacher, why are you naming sin, sin? People need to know that it's wrong. Amen. News media ain't going to say it. Ha, huh. no, sir. They'll lose their ratings, won't they? Uh huh. Politician ain't going to say it. They'll lose a vote. Say, preacher, why are you going to say it? You'll lose your job. Well, by the grace of God, I'll still be in his favor. Amen. Say, preacher, you're being boastful. You're bragging and so forth. Call it whatever you may, friend. If God says this is what it is, I'm siding with him. And I hope that you're on the same boat with me. Hey, the Bible goes on and tells us now that it's sin of this thing of intoxication. Boy, how you lose your mind and you forget the law. You forget to what? To do what is right. That's what the Bible says about drinking. And all of those casual drinkers, it's still sin, friend. It's still sin. I'm going to go on from this right here because why? I believe that nail's been nailed down. We'll come back if it pokes his head back up. Hey, it's still sin not to love God. Amen. That's the first commandment you are to obey. Love God with what? All your heart. Love God, not half-heartedly. And see, you know this by now, adult. Don't look at me like you're strange. Don't look at me, boy, preacher, that's a new gate to me. I ain't never seen that. You have. You know what it means to be fully committed or to be half-hearted. See, some of you are halfway in right now. You're already looking to get out. Some of you right now say, preacher, get to your very last point. I'm ready to go home. You're halfway in this service. I know what that looks like, and it's okay. I'm glad you're just still hanging on, amen. I want you to get fully in here, praise God. I still want you to see exactly what I'm seeing, that those that commit sin and those that have been infected by sin need the healing that Jesus Christ can only give. 
And I thank God that he ministers healing. Can I go a little step further on this right here? Loving God. If you don't love God, that's still sin. If you put anything else before God, that is sin. That's idolatry. Amen. Idolatry. Amen. Putting anything before God. Say, preacher, what are you saying? If you put anything before doing and obeying the word of God, that is your God. Amen. The Bible says us for us to love our neighbors, right? Not loving your neighbor is a sin. Preacher, don't you understand who lives beside me? They're so filthy. They're so nasty. They're so vile. They're so vulgar. I mean, you're telling me to love them. I didn't say that. Jesus did. Amen. Now, that's your neighbor in your neighborhood. But there's the neighbor as well on your pew. Amen. Amen. Say, preacher, you believe there's people in the church right here that hate each other? They might not say it out loud, but they live it. Say, preacher, you're meddling. No, I'm telling the truth. You come into the house of God like you're in love with everybody, but then you leave, and boy, you act like you hate everybody. Oh, I'm t it's high time that we awaken out of our sleep. It's high time to people and say, preacher, that offended me. Well, good. That rock hit you good then. Amen. If that pricked your heart, my dear friend, I want you to know you can be forgiven. We're to love each other, praise God. Do you not realize where we're going to spend eternity together with? Every single person that's saved by the grace of God. And if you've got any hatred, if you've got any hatred towards your brother, how God forbid. First John said, you don't love God. That's what he said now. Amen. We're to be loving each other. Oh, boy, i got to hurry up. I ain't even got off the first page. <laughs> I'm letting y'all know now. There's two more to go. I said, preacher, you got to let your people go. My dear friend, I love you, praise the Lord. I'm just telling you now, Jesus can grant the healing. All of what I just told you there, all of those sins. And, oh, we'll even say this. We've got some younger ones in here. The Bible does say to what? Honor thy father and thy mother. Amen. Oh, I, I, we got some teachers in here as well, don't we? Oh, yes, we do. Love it. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm telling you now, we got the Good News Club. We do it over there in Sherall. I hope you'll join in with us if you're able to do that. But nonetheless, we're over there. We see a little bit of what y'all taste for eight hours. We get it. We get it now. Boy, not all, every child that comes into there is all loving and dubbing. Yes, sir. And no, sir. And yes, ma'am. And no, ma'am. Boy, there's so much just mean disrespectful. You give them something, what do they do? They tear it up. No, we, we give them these little old things, a little name tag, and one decides he's going to chew it up. I'm just telling you now. I know it's kind of funny, but there's some other things that teachers go through that's horrible. Where are they learning that from? They're not honoring mom and daddy at home. They're not going to honor them out in public. And mamas and daddies, it's up to you and I to make sure that they honor us. Oh, yes. He that spares the rod, what? Hates the child. Oh, I know this is not popular. And I know what's going to be said. And I know where people, oh, say, preacher, you're going to destroy them. No, oh, there ain't a spanking I got that destroyed me. Amen. Come on now. There ain't a spanking that I got that ruined me and that caused me. No, if anything, it put fear in me. Well, I remember one of the worst spankings I ever got. Y'all know my story. Y'all know my story there. My mom, my dad, and everything. You should. If not, I'll tell you later. I'm, I won't know. But I remember the worst spanking I ever got. Went and visited my dad. One weekend there, he had one of those, one of those wall heaters. You know, had the bricks in them. You know, those little, uh, those little uh, uh, clay bricks. You know what I'm talking about? Right? Oil heater. I don't know what you call it. Anyway, had one of them out there in the barn. I seen those bricks. I ain't never seen white bricks before in my life. Maybe y'all have, but I never seen them in my life. Brother Jeff, I thought it was the strangest thing. So what I do, I go over there and I see a piece of steel in my daddy's barn. And I take that piece of steel rod about yay long and I poke it and I poke it and literally it chips off. I said, boy, isn't that neat? And I poke on it again, I poke on it again. It just disintegrated. It fell apart. I said, whoa, that is awesome. I destroyed the whole thing. <laughs> Roland Pope comes up behind me and said, boy, what'd you do? I said, look, daddy, I broke all of it. Whew. Enough said, friend. I remembered the next old heater that I seen, or next pro, whatever heater that was that I seen that had those bricks, I stayed away from it. <laughs> next time I had a thought in my mind to say, hey, that looks pretty neat. Let me go over and touch it. I said, I'm going to stay away from it. I'm just going to tell you this right here. Listen to me, child of God. The Bible says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. If you can live in sin and you can dwell in sin and not suffer the chastening of God, you're a bastard and none of his. And I'm not cussing there. 
Don't you dare say that. See, that's another thing that gets me. We've allowed our English language to be taken over. Mm -hmm. And the preacher would use such a word that way. And you know I used it in the right context, did I not? And they say, oh, he's a cussing preacher. No, I'm not. You're not of God. You need to be saved. If you can live in sin and not suffer the punishment of God, you need to be born again today. Listen now. Hey, sin is sin. Boy, I, I'm telling you this right here. The Bible calls it sin, and we should agree with God's holy word. May we never side with ourselves, never side with man, never side with the devil, but always side with God. Hallelujah. Why? He said, thy word is forever settled in heaven, and it's the only word that's ever settled in heaven. Amen. Not mine, not yours, but God's word for him. Can I say this right here? Don't believe this lie that the devil is telling, and don't believe the lie that the devil is telling others and even yourself that you can handle sin on your own. If that was the case, Christ would have never died on the cross. If you could handle sin and you could heal yourself from the illness of sin, Jesus Christ would have never died. May I say this right here? You cannot handle the sins of omission or commission. You cannot handle the sins that you've committed, that others committed to you and that you committed to them. You can't handle it. But I know one that can, hallelujah. His name is Jesus, praise God. I just want you to know, praise the Lord. Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but why sinners to repentance. I'll remind you over there in Acts chapter 5. I was going to quote it, but let's read it, praise God. Why? Because it's the holy word of God and we need to. Over in Acts chapter 5, repentance. Oh no, it's not of works. Uh, repentance is not a work, friend. Repentance is a gift from God. Acts chapter 5, verse number 31. The Bible says, Him, Jesus Christ, God hath exalted at his right hand to be a prince and a savior to give repentance to give repentance you give a gift friend amen you labor and you work there with these toiling hands here but but, to, to, but the bible says repentance is given unto you and i through who jesus christ god forbid we get to the place where we view repentance as it's an awful thing my dear friends, the best thing that I've ever done in my life. Because why? Repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is salvation. Hey, in the day that you got saved, you repented of your sins. No repentance, no regeneration. Hey, the Holy Spirit of God brings what? Light and understanding with His conviction and open up your eyes and letting you see the wages of your sin is death without Jesus Christ. But you can be forgiven through Christ. It's a gift, friend, to be, be, be of repenting there. Why? People need to repent. And repenting here is confessing your need for forgiveness. Repentance is confessing your need that you have offended God Almighty and you need Him to forgive you. Oh, I'm thankful, hallelujah, the psalmist said in Psalms 86 there that the Lord is ready to forgive. He will forgive if you ask. He will forgive you of your sins if you confess your sins. When people confess their need for a doctor, they're realizing this is out of my hands. I cannot do this on my own. You cannot handle sin. You cannot forgive yourself of sin because when you sin, you sin against God. Amen. When you sin, you sin against God, my dear friend. And I want you to know this right here, that I'm thankful that there's a doctor, hallelujah, that will minister healing unto you when you recognize the need of forgiveness and Jesus will forgive. He'll put that bomb of Gilead in that womb and close it up, hallelujah. He'll relieve you, my dear friend, of such condemnation that weighs heavy upon you. Jesus Christ will save your soul, but not only save your soul, but he'll lighten the load. Hallelujah. I want you to know this and listen to me well. Every time that I ever go to a doctor, you know what that doctor does to me? Maybe your doctor doesn't do this, but mine does. Now, and I might, I might pronounce this incorrectly, so you nurses to correct me later on this right here, but he'll take out that otoscope, right? And he'll take out that otoscope. He'll take out that little big fancy flashlight is what I call it there now. He'll take out that otoscope, and boy, he'll start looking in my ears. He'll start looking in my nose and looking in my mouth. What is he doing? He's examining me. The light of thy word, hallelujah, will examine examine you. The preaching of the word of Christ. The preaching of the cross. What does it do? It causes you to be examined by the Holy Spirit of God. Enlightening your eyes. 
So the doctor can make the right prognosis. Amen. So he can say, you know what? This is what you need to do. Now see, here again, some of you, you've offended your brother. The Bible says you need to go to him. Some of you have lied, cheated, and stole. You need to give back. Amen. Oh, I remember this, friend. I remember it had probably about maybe four months after the Lord saved me. Man comes into church. He comes into church, bro, Jeff. Man sits back there in the back pew. I'm up there. I'm leading to singing. I'm washed in the blood. Hallelujah. I'm singing about Jesus, forgiving my sins. The Holy Ghost of God could convicted me right then and there. He said, you stole money from that boy. And I did. I'm being honest. I did. Your, your pastor wasn't spotless. Hallelujah. Uh-uh. I stole money from him. I was going to buy some speakers from him. And he said, here, you take them, you put them in your car and listen to them, see if you like them. I drove off with them. I said, preacher, that's bad. I know it's bad. I, call, I told you it's bad. It's sin, friend. Stealing is sin. God, the Holy Ghost got all over me. Wayne left out the back door at the end of service. In church, I had to go. I had to go. If not, the peace of God would have been taken away from me. I said, preacher, you believe that? I sure do. You're not going to live in sin as a child of God. Boy went in there and I told him, I said, Wayne, God saved me, forgave me of my sins. He made me a new individual. I know I did you wrong. Here's $50. I'll give the rest $25 tomorrow. And I did. I'm just telling you this right here, dear friend. God Almighty, He wants to set us free. Set us free of the sins. He will prescribe unto you. There may be somebody that you've done wrong and you know you've been living that way for five, five months, five days or whatever it may be. You've robbed from them. You may have even stole the limelight from them and say that you did it, but they did. You need to make that right. It's the medicine that God gives unto the children of God to live that life that's better and to live that life that's higher than those that are lost and living in darkness. When you confess your need, praise God, I'm glad that Jesus Christ will prescribe the right medicine for your soul. I'm glad, hallelujah, that there's nothing that you're going through that Jesus cannot carry you through and heal you through. Amen. Jesus Christ can do that. I want you to know this right here. Some of you, you might need the doctor to bring life back into your life. You're dead and you need a doctor. Say, what are you saying? The Bible says over there in Romans chapter 7 and verse number 9, and Paul said to himself, he said, I was alive once, but then the law revealed and I died. The Word of God is revealed unto you. The Holy Spirit of God is revealed unto you that you're lost in your sins. You're dead without God and you need to be made alive. I've got good news for you, friend. Jesus Christ can do that for you today. All you have to do is believe in the gospel. It's repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's some of you, you need the doctor to mend your wounds. What sin has done in your life and done in your heart. Whether it's your own ones you committed or somebody committed towards you. As I said earlier, there's some of you, you're battling things that happened to you as a child. It's still there. It still hurts. And you need Jesus, friend, to minister that healing to your soul only like he can. There's some of you, you're struggling with the decisions that others has made and it impacted you and is, one, and is weighing heavily upon you. It's like you're not getting free from it. And boy, it's weighing you down and it's hurting you there. You need what Jesus Christ can give. And I got good news for you today, church. Regardless, hallelujah, Jesus can give the healing unto your soul because why? There's still power in the blood, hallelujah. There's still power in the blood. That's what the Bible said over here in, in, in 1 Peter chapter 2. It said, He himself bare our own sins in his own body on the tree, that being dead to sin, we should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes were healed. By whose stripes ye were healed. There's healing in the blood of Jesus Christ. A preacher, you have lost your mind. No, my dear friend, I tell you that this is supernatural, divine power by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. You will not see it physically. You will not see it with these fleshly eyes. But my dear friend, you will experience it in your soul when the blood is applied and healing is administered. Oh, you know how it, means, how it feels to, to be cut deep to the soul. When somebody's betrayed you, when you've lost trust in an individual, when somebody has sinned greatly against you, you need Jesus to heal you. 
That sin that you keep running back to and going to and you don't have victory over and it keeps getting deeper and deeper into your life there, my dear friend, Jesus can heal you of that and deliver you from that sin. Jesus will prescribe the right medicine. There's healing in Christ. I'm thankful that just one, one drop of the precious blood of Jesus Christ applied by faith. The Pharisees, and I'm done, the Pharisees did not see the need for healing. Do you see your need this morning? Are you trying to patch yourself up? Are you trying to get these self-help books are you trying to get these Christianese words? You're trying to cling on to some kind of good saying that somebody said to minister healing. Friend, this thing is real. Mr. Richard, we're talking about prayer. Prayer is a powerful thing that we neglect, that you neglect. You get your healing through prayer. You get your healing when you lay your life out before Christ on the operating table. Can I just say there's so much more I wanted to say, I promise you. And I'm not. I, I'm, we're going to wrap it up. Matter of fact, sister, if you just come to the piano here. Church, I want you to know now, when you go to the doctor, you're admitting to that doctor, you know what? I cannot solve the problem. I've got a sickness. I've got an illness. I've got something that's hindering me. I need your help. I want you to know Jesus Christ. He said he's an ever-present help. He'll minister that healing to you. But you've got to confess your need. Don't be like the Pharisees. Sit there on your pew. Young, young and old, it doesn't matter your age. Don't sit there and say, I don't need the help. Your heart's just hurting as others. You've got wounds that need healing just like anybody else. You've got a sickness that needs to be cured. Some of you may be doubting. Some of you may be questioning, whatever it may be. I want you to know, friend, Jesus, the great physician, the physician. Oh, hallelujah. I hope you've seen that in the text there. And I thank God that he brought it back to remembrance there. Notice he said in verse number 17, he said, they that are whole and have no need of the physician. Not a physician, but the physician. There's only one great physician and it's Jesus. He'll minister healing to your soul, to your mind that's been polluted, to your mind that's been scarred, to your soul those emotions that you have that are not natural, He'll minister healing to you. What healing do you need? Life brought back into you through salvation? What healing do you need? Sin forgiven? Victory over? What healing do you need to forgive a loved one? To forgive a friend? You'll find it in Jesus. And only in Jesus. Father, in the name of Christ, the invitation is here before your people. My God, you see us. Lord, you know us. The doctors have to shine the light, Lord, all through us and inspect us, but the eyes of the Lord are everywhere. And you see us, Almighty God. Lord, you know. Lord, there's people in our midst. Lord, they've been hurt by those that's gone on by the grave. Lord, they're still hurting on the inside and they need healing. Lord, they, they're, they're people, oh Lord, that they don't even know if they're alive and they've done things to them and they need healing. Lord, there's people right here in the house of God that need the precious blood of Jesus Christ applied upon them. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can live the life victoriously. God, grant that healing today. Grant that curing, the cleansing. And we'll praise you for what you do. In Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand to your feet, please?